Hey friend, Colin here from Something's Recording, and today I'm gonna give you a tour of my home studio. Today we're gonna be going around here at the studio. I'm gonna show you all the gear, all the equipment that we're using here at the studio, how I'm setting up my studio, and hopefully give you some ideas on how you can set up your home studio as well. But before we dive in, if you're ready to go a little bit deeper into the mixing process, in its entirety and really start to hone your workflow as an audio engineer, then I have just the thing for you. It is my seven step mixing checklist and it's just a simple PDF that will walk you through the entire mixing process step by step to help you get professional and radio ready mixes without any more of the guesswork and without any more of the hassle. It is a completely free guide and you can get access to that by clicking the link below in the video description. Now let's jump in here and take a look around the studio. All right, here's the view coming into the studio. It's a basement studio, so you come down the stairs here and we are into the studio. We're gonna kind of start on this side of the room, uh, more gear and extraneous type of stuff, and we'll move over towards uh, the main control center here, as well as uh, the booth in the back. So starting here on this side of the room, is kind of the entertainment center, the entertainment side of the studio. You can see we've got uh, some old 70s style speakers here with lots and lots of records strewn across this side of the room here, this back wall, and they run for uh, the record player we have here. This is my dad's old record player here, but it's really nice to have something to play vinyl in the room. Whether we want to just listen to vinyl or whether I want to hook stuff up here and listen to mixes back on these older style speakers, it's cool to hear stuff coming back out of these speakers here. We have a little amp hooked up for monitoring on this side of the room if we need uh, loud style monitoring going on. Uh, there's a random guitar case here. Uh, there is old uh, an old Xbox here, so if I ever need a break or if someone needs a break in the studio, uh, that is there if we need it. Uh, lots of old CDs to play with the record player, uh, movies, and of course, Xbox games as well. There is one guitar spot over here. There's a couple amps and a couple DI boxes set up in the room. Uh, four guitar players for instrumentalists to hook up into, whether it's bass or guitar or sometimes harmonica if they need to plug in here. Uh, there's an amp here, and you can see there is a DI box here with a cord hooked into it that runs into the amp, as well as over to the other side into the board. There is a microphone here, so if we, if we ever need to do live off-the-floor tracking or if I have the band in here for rehearsal, that goes here in the center of the room, and we can have usually a uh, five or six piece band playing live off the floor in the room here. Right now, the center of the room, the center of, I guess, the, the live room in the studio is set up for acoustic guitar tracking or ukulele or mandolin tracking, uh, any kind of live instrument tracking. We've got the chair here, and then we've got this nice Lewitt 540 Sub-Zero uh, all prepped and ready to record, and the headphones are on the back there. They run across into the headphone amp there, which I'll show you later on as we get over there. There's a nice sofa here, which actually does some sound absorbing as well. It's a nice big fluffy sofa with a blanket. We can always throw the blanket up if we need extra baffling or anything out here. Guitar stand there. We've got these congas and bongos set up here. So if I do ever need them for uh, any kind of softer folk songs or anything, they are here and I can throw any of the uh, various mics that are set up on this side of the room on these to get sound from these. Uh, let's go over here before we finish this side of the room. Uh, we have Alpine. Alpine is our resident stuffed animal, our resident polar bear. As you can see, he is number one, Alpine. Uh, we have a fan here if we need it in the summer, if it gets too hot down here. A couple guitar stands that are <laughs> out of place here. This is the bass amp here. We don't often, or I don't often mic this very, very much anymore. I just take the DI out of the front of the amp here but you can see the settings when we do use it live here in the studio. So if, if I do mic it, or if we have a band playing again live off the floor, uh, this is here if we need it. Giant, giant PV TNT 115. Huge, huge sound, and it's very heavy amp as well. These are the basses. This is the bass wall, as well as uh, uh, the JP, the John Prichucci guitar, the Music Man. Uh, we have pretty much everything we need here in terms of bass and sound and style. We've got a violin, we've got the Rickenbacker, and then we've got a uh, a Squire jazz style bass here, which I actually, I'm going to be honest, I love this more than any uh, Fender jazz bass that I've ever heard. It just has a nice, 
deep, clean sound to it. It records very, very well. So does the uh, the violin bass. We just got that set up as well. That's a Univox here. This is our kind of little bookshelf here. We've got a uh, few books up top here, recording engineering books and old uh, guitar repair and uh, chord construction books. The middle shelf here is tools for fixing. Uh, this is like for fixing cables and stuff. And then we've got a, a big bag of any tool we need to fix uh, guitars, amps, or anything we need here at the studio. There's a cable tester back there. And then the bottom shelf is assorted pedals, whether we need distortion pedals or switcher pedals for amps or anything. Tissue box and picks up top. Candle if we need it here as well as measuring tape. This hallway goes back over to a bedroom there. We've got the garbage can here. We'll get to this shelf here in a second. Let's finish this side of the room over here. You can see there's lots of guitars around the studio. I'm not going to walk through all of them, but this is kind of our fender wall over here, as well as a, a couple music bands go up in the places that are there. One of them's in the case there. Uh, it's a couple Luke music bands. Uh, we got the Tele, the Strat, a couple acoustics there. There's an old 25th anniversary ovation. Uh, my brother's Taylor's there. That is my favorite acoustic guitar for tracking here, if we're tracking acoustic guitar in the center of the room. I love the way that Taylor records. Bunch of electrics here, uh, a few of the other ones. There's more upstairs as well as on stands here. One of the Lukes, the Music Mans, we've got an Epiphone 335, Gretsch 12 string here, uh, another Gretsch Electromatic. Moving over here, we've got keyboards as well as amps. And another little side table here is for waters, for clients, for uh, a wireless mic actually goes back in that spot there. You can see we've got books and stuff underneath. Uh, this is a Fender Frontman, uh, another amp that doesn't get very much uh, actual usage mic-wise, uh, but it's another one we run if we need rehearsals or if we have a band running live off the floor here. This one, this is our other amp station here, runs into the DI box down there, and you can see our cord is running out here for any kind of pedal boards that need to get hooked up in the room. Back here's our keyboard station. So we're kind of doing all our instruments here first before we get to uh, the engineering side of things. But it's nice to have lots of instruments set up in the room. So whether any kind of band that comes in, there's a plethora and assortment of instruments for them to pick and choose from. Uh, a couple Yamaha keyboards here, a DGX-230 on top, uh, a P115 on the bottom here. This one is used mainly for uh, piano sounds, but it also has a nice organ sound and electric piano sound is on it as well. This one has all the, the horns, the synthesizers, uh, and keyboard sounds that we need for uh, tracking into the board there. It also runs into this computer here. This is kind of an idea I got from uh, Jill Gilder watching Home Studio Corner back in the day. It runs into this little interface here, it runs into a little audio box, and that runs into the board. So I can actually run sounds off the computer from another Studio One rig here and print them right uh, onto the main Studio One rig here. We've got a couple speakers in the back of the room here. Like I said, again, for any kind of rehearsals or uh, loudspeakers that we need in the room, uh, whether it's overdubs, if we want to mic speakers in the room here and get kind of natural reverb sounds, we can do that with these big guys here. And we've got a little keyboard here for uh, uh, mobile control. Here is the main rig in the room where everything runs into. And then we've got the pieces on the side as well here. So my main uh, recording device, my main interface, is the Studio Live 32S here. All the instruments, the DI boxes, everything you've seen here in the room is running into this guy here. Uh, I use almost all of the channels except for uh, five or six channels here that nothing is running into, but everything else is hooked up and ready to go at a moment's notice. You just hit record, pull the fader up, and it's ready to record and be captured here. I actually like, I'm going to point this out here, I actually like this old Macintosh keyboard. I got this when I got my first Pro Tools rig. I ran off this this giant Mac tower here. That other one is for a, a project I'm working on for a band. We're ripping files off their old Mac. But this is what I started on, and it ran into a big uh, Digidesign converter. And when I got that, I got this keyboard with it, and I actually still use it to this day because I like I like the thicker keyboards like this. The uh, the other Mac one that was over in the corner here is just my mobile one. So that's actually hooked into the sides here, which is one of the main reasons I like this keyboard. It has two USBs on each side of it so I can put my mouse into it as well as the other keyboard so I can walk around if I need to be recording uh, in the booth. I have access to that here. I don't have to come out and hit record or anything like that. The computer running the whole rig is here and this is actually a new guy here. I just upgraded to this. 
This is one of the new Max Studios. Uh, I believe I got the Max version. So it's the lower model. It's not as souped up. I'm not doing a lot of video editing or intense video editing. So I don't need something that's super, super powerful with lots and lots of storage, especially because I run uh, my Glyph black box drive here. So these two guys together give me a ton of power to run the rig off of. And the, the Max Studio is just unbelievably fast and unbelievably powerful, as well as the, the Glyph back, black box drive, excuse me. Uh, it's an eight terabyte drive. So it gives me plenty of external storage for whatever projects I want to do, as well as client projects. So the entire Studio One system runs off of the Mac Studio, and then all of my files that I record to, all my session files, run off of the black box drive. So a ton of power, and it gives me super, super fast access. Now, in terms of speakers, we'll talk about these while they are here. Uh, I've been using these M-Audio BX8s forever. I guess since I started recording, since I started the studio here, uh, I've never changed. Uh, I know what they sound like. I'm comfortable on them. They don't give me a ton of low end, but I do a lot of my mixing on uh, these guys here. These are uh, the Sennheiser HD280 Pros, and they give me all the information I need to get accurate sounding mixes. And then I can use the main speakers, the loudspeakers in the room for reference uh, or to do any tweaks that I need to hear off of uh, more live style speakers. And I can also use uh, the big American audios for reference as well. Coming down to look at the, the pieces of gear on the side here, my little journal there, my little to-do list. These are mainly used for drum tracking. I've got a pair of the PreSonus Eurekas. So snare top and snare bottom run into these. They just get a little bit of gain from the input here. I flip the phase on the snare top. They get a little bit of saturation, which is one of the things I like about the Eureka. So it pulls off some of the harsher transients, especially if you have uh, a drummer that's hitting really, really hard, having a piece of outboard gear like this to kind of clip those bigger transients and make sure it's not really wild going into your DAW and your digital system is really, really nice. And then just a touch of EQ on each one as well. The bottom guy here, I actually run uh, the kick drums out to. So it's an old DBX. I think it's a 266. Yeah, 266. Uh, so it's a two-channel compressor uh, as well as a gate. I don't use the gate. I, don't, I hate gates. <laughs> I'll say that there. I hate gates. Um, but uh, two channel, I run the kick, uh, the kick in and the kick out into that. Moving over to the other side here, just a couple pieces of gear on this side. There's a power conditioner here that most of the main rig here runs into. So I have a main hub for all the power in the room. Having a power conditioner is really nice and it gives me a level of safety as well with everything that's plugged in. Uh, there is a headphone amp here. So the main headphone cable here running out to uh, the little space we have in the center of the room where we were tracking acoustic guitar and then this guy here runs back into uh, the drum room so it gives me four channels to run out into the room or back into the drum room or over to the keyboards or wherever i need in the room here and then up top is the warm audio 73 the wa 73 this is the preamp that the vocal mic runs into i also use it for uh, the drum room mic as well so that's our main rig inside the room We'll kind of make our way over here. This is all the mic, so it's kind of our little mic locker here. We've got a couple bags on the bottom here, but just a little glimpse here. Uh, the D112, the Audix i5, the Roswell Mini K47, uh, the AKG P220s back here. This is uh, the Steven Slate mic, which I don't use very much anymore. Uh, the Sterling, what oh, is it, the S50, uh, that's up on the kick drum. It's actually under a blanket. A couple sure mics back there and then we've got a bunch of mic clips here these are the sennheisers uh the 441s uh and then coming down here we've got uh, a bunch of old drum kits which which these are actually used uh more for live now and then some of the 57s that are on the kit in the room here oh getting back up a couple more guitars here spot for the les paul uh the sg there nice calendar moving back we are into the drum room here so here's actually the Roswell, the Mini K47. That's our main vocal mic here at the studio, and it also serves as a room mic for the beautiful drum kit here in the room. This is an assortment of pieces on the drum kit. It's mainly comprised of a Pearl Vision kit, but there's a couple extraneous pieces, and then lots and lots of symbols. There's a bag down here with whatever kind of symbol we want to grab for the kit, whether it's Sabians, 
uh, whether it's Paiste, Zildjian's, whatever we need, whatever the artist wants is pretty much here and ready for use. We've got an assortment of snares. This is kind of our drum cabinet here. We've got drum heads, cleaning tools, extra DI boxes, uh, pillows, dampening stuff, and lots of pedals and such down below. Weights, if we need to weigh anything down as well. So we've got our snare locker here. I think we've got bags up top here. And then we've got some percussion and stuff down below here as well as some more heads and sticks. You can kind of see all the mics we have on the kit here. There's a full breakdown on the channel, but I'll give you a quick rundown. Uh, overheads, we've got a pair of 57s that run into a mic modeler. So those are moonlighting as U87s here. And then we've got uh, 421s around the kit here. Did I say 441s when I was out there? I meant 421s. Sennheiser 421s uh, running around the toms here. Underneath here is that Sterling mic I talked about. Uh, that runs on the outside of the kick drum. Uh, it's baffled off, so we don't have uh, a lot of cymbal bleed going into it. Oh, moving around here. Here's our headphones that are running into the headphone amp. So those run out front. I have control over those. We've got the Audix i5 on the snare top. And then we've got a Shure on the bottom snare there. Here's our Sennheiser microphones. And then we've got one of those, uh, these cheapo, these PG Shures uh, on the high tom here. Because it doesn't have a lot of bottom end that we need. And sometimes the smaller tom that's up here, it can get a lot smaller than this. And having a big 421 on it can be uh, kind of a bear for uh, the drummer there. So that's kind of a view of our kit here. The, the AKG, the D112, is inside there. I don't know if you can see it, but that's where that guy is. That's kind of our drum room here, as well as our vocal booth. That is the main view of the studio. So our main control hub here, as well as our ISO booth and drum tracking booth here at the studio. I hope that was helpful for you today and I hope that was insightful for you to see how I have the studio set up here and maybe it gives you some ideas on how you can change your setup or how you can get your studio set up in the first place. As I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you're ready to take your mixes to the next level and really start dialing in your workflow as an audio engineer, then I have just the tool for you and it is completely free. It is my seven step mixing checklist and you can download it below using the link in the video description. It's gonna help you get more professional sounding mixes in less time completely free to download. Go ahead and check that out if you're interested. Thank you so much for watching today and I will see you in the next video.